Ja, ja, dat weet ik. Your, the spelling of your first name is unusual. Yes. Uh, it's totally unique or it's... Uh, it's very unique. <laughs> so yeah. There are not many others that you'll find. <laughs> Have you find uh, one, at least one? Yes. Ah, so yeah. it's not... Uh, yeah, not totally unique. Not totally, yeah, yeah. It's, it's very rare, though. Yeah, yeah. Very But do you pronounce it different? Jonathan. Jonathan. Yeah, it doesn't. Same. Yeah, yeah. Same, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Good. Dear Chaplain Ward, thank you very much for accepting my invitation. Yes. I look forward for quite a time to, to having you, and I'm glad we are able to have this conversation uh, today. The name of the program is uh, The Starting Point, and uh, usually we think on the real beginnings of our life, and we are going to speak on that. But at this very time, you are also in front of a kind of a starting point. You are torn between different different options and alternatives and uh, callings. <laughs> uh, what is your process of waiting and uh, weighing and, and, uh, and uh, making decisions in times like uh, that? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I, I like the title, Starting Point, yeah. <laughs> um, because a starting point for me has always been the story that my mother told oh. on the first time I preached at my home church. Really? I'd never heard the story before. Huh. And when my best friend introduced me, she had shared the story with him as part of my introduction. And the story goes that when she was in labor with me and struggling um, to birth me into the world, yes. that she prayed and stopped at that moment and said, Lord, He belongs to you. Oh. And if you will allow me to have him and to bring him into this world, I dedicate his life to you. But she never shared that story with That's me. That's interesting. She never shared it with me. She said she did not want me to feel pressured oh. to follow a certain path, but she just prayed, right? That's and so my starting point was with God long before I knew. <laughs> and then later in life, I made a decision on my own to uh, accept Christ as my Savior and to give my life to him at a young age. Yeah. Uh, while I was serving in the military in the United States Air Force, uh, military in the medical corps. Mm -hmm. So my starting point is always God. Yes. Where does God want me to go? When does he want me to go? <laughs> and how does he want me to get there? Yeah. And God has always answered. So that's where I start with always, is with prayer with God and asking him to lead me and guide me and to choose my next stop. Yeah, so at this time you you follow the same the same pattern. Yes. Yeah. So at this time in life, I I, I do. I've I've shared that with my kids and my children, my 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 wife. We always follow God's leading, and at whatever turning point I'm at, uh, if I am uh, rooted and enjoying where I am and and feel that that's the place I'm <laughs> going to be for the rest of my life. God may say to me, no, I have another <laughs> stop for you. And so as God has said that to me, I am willing to go wherever and whenever he says so, as long as I know it's him that's leading and not my own choice and desire. And so I'm at a turning point as to whether or not I should stay where I am as a chaplain and a director of community ministry or whether I should uh, look at a different calling at this time in my life, uh, and hopefully the last one so I can retire. <laughs> But I think that's up to God when I retire. Uh, I leave that to him. He opens doors and he closes doors, and I'm so grateful for that because there have been times when I have opened the wrong door <laughs> yeah. and I have closed the <laughs> wrong door. So I like to leave it up to God. Well, uh, let's return to, to those uh, beginnings. Mm -hmm. uh, you shared already a very moving story, and uh, it was also very, very interesting, very intriguing that you learned that uh, 20-some years after that. Mm -hmm. yeah, your mother was there. Your mother was alive at that time. Uh, yeah, yes, sure, yes, sure. Yes, yes. Did you ask her after that? Uh, 
No, I no, never, no. I never asked her. Interesting. I, I, I never did, and <clears throat> I didn't hear the story of my birth and her struggles and uh -huh. my dedication to God yes. before I was even brought into the world. Right, yeah. it reminds me of uh, Jeremiah to a certain yes. degree. Um, so I was thankful that she hadn't shared it with me. Um, mm -hmm. So I knew that it was my journey. Mm -hmm. And I knew it was my relationship with Christ, <laughs> you know, but like most parents, they try to set a very good example, right, and model Christ and his goodness. And each evening, I remember, especially on Friday evenings, uh, she would read to me from the Bible and one of my favorite mm -hmm. books to this day, Desire of Ages, oh, uh, written yes. by uh, Ellen G. White, yes. a very, very good book about the life of Christ. And she would read that book to me and I love the stories. I love the stories mm -hmm. of Jesus' life. And later in life, it was that book, along with the Bible, that helped me to find Christ for myself <laughs> and to experience a conversion experience at the age of 22 oh. while serving in the U.S. Air Force as a medical corpsman. I see. So tell us a little bit about uh, the, the surroundings of your, of your uh, early childhood, uh, your family, uh, what? What kind of life, where, yes, yes. and uh, what are your earliest memories? Well, my earliest memories are growing up in southeast uh, part of the United States, in Georgia, in mm -hmm. the deep south, as we call it, in <laughs> Georgia. And I grew up in the, in the 60s when Martin Luther King was still alive and preaching, and, and uh, John Kennedy was president, and... Bobby Kennedy, his brother, was the attorney the general. general yes. It was a very turbulent time. Racial uh, unrest in America um, was very difficult. Yes. Segregation. Yes. And I grew up uh, in the heart of Atlanta, Georgia, oh. uh, seeing this and hearing this and seeing how men and women would try to work together to bring about racial harmony and, and justice. And it was a very difficult time. In the midst of that, God was always in the center, mm -hmm. especially for my family. And in the deep south in Georgia, in the United States of America, we call that the Bible Belt. Because yes. many people, uh, uh, many faiths, uh, many practices uh, that are there, and uh, people are, tend to be very spiritual yes. and religious. Yes. Uh, and I grew up early on as Pentecostal. Mm -hmm. And uh, would go uh, to church with my mother and my dad and my sisters. And we later, after moving, uh, we became Southern Baptists. Mm -hmm. and joined the Baptist uh, church and practiced uh, that faith for some years, as I remember. And then the journey turned a bit uh, when my mother attended uh, and my sisters a Seventh-day Adventist uh, evangelistic revival session. Yes. And they heard the preaching mm -hmm. and they were very moved. And my mother, I remember she asked our pastor, Reverend Thomas, mm -hmm. about the Sabbath. And he shared uh, some of his thoughts about that but it wasn't uh, what she thought it would be. It didn't come from scripture as she had hoped. Mm -hmm. And so her journey turned a bit. So do you know more specifically what were her questions to the she pastor? She specifically asked him about the Sabbath. About the Sabbath. She was very inquisitive about the Sabbath because we never knew uh, that there was a, a Sabbath even spoken of in Scripture. Hmm. And so we learned that the seventh day is a Sabbath that's in the Bible. And it's the day that Jesus Christ worshiped on. Yeah. And so she asked uh, Reverend Thomas, why is it as Baptists do we not keep the seventh day Sabbath, which is on Saturday and it's in the Bible? Mm -hmm. And could he show her yeah. from the Bible why we don't worship on that particular day in Sabbath, but why we worship on an alternate day, which was Sunday, first day of the week. So most probably yes. she was uh, hoping, really hoping, yes. that the pastor would be able to show her yes, yes. something she missed. Yes. <laughs> so she invited him and had her Bible, and he brought his Bible. Mm -hmm. And he looked at her very honestly. I'll never forget. I was probably nine or ten. Uh, you, you were there? Yeah, I was there. I oh. was there. I was there mm -hmm. listening intently. Yeah, and yeah. Um, I was a kid, but I was listening. Sure. And I remember he leaned forward, and he said to my mother, her name was Ina, mm -hmm. he said, Ina, I cannot show you from the scriptures mm -hmm. where you will find the day that we have chosen to worship on in the Bible. Hmm. It's not there. Hmm. What is in the Bible is the seventh day Sabbath. Hmm. And that is there. 
And she said, well, Reverend Thomas, why then do we worship on a different day than what in, what's in the Bible? Yeah. And he said to her, Ina, we, re, re, we worship on a different day, on that first day, that Sunday, in recognition of the death and resurrection of Christ mm -hmm. Jesus. Um, however, it's not the Bible Sabbath. Mm -hmm. uh, and she said to him, I'll never forget, mm -hmm. she said, Reverend Thomas, mm -hmm. I love you, uh, but I cannot continue. Mm -hmm. I must follow the Bible. And that was she, the, she said, she that, said all, that to him yes. on the spot. I mean, yeah, on the spot, on the spot, because she had been studying, uh, and, she studying heard, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, she said to him, You know, I cannot continue, I have to follow the Bible mm -hmm. Sabbath. And he said to her, uh, Ina, follow your conscience, very, very do what God is leading you to do. And I was very surprised, even as a child, and I remember this so clearly, he didn't argue with her. He didn't debate. Mm -hmm. He just said to her, follow your conscience and, and go as God is leading you. you know? Very, very moving. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And so that, that impression of that moment, and I think of that pastor's compassion and understanding uh, stayed with me mm. for, forever. I was thinking on yeah. that. <laughs> yes, yes, stayed with me forever. <laughs> uh, you know, and that was a very, very memorable moment. Mm -hmm. And so we eventually... Um, became members of the Seventh-day Adventist mm -hmm. uh, denomination and faith and uh, from a young age, from the age of about 10, I guess, yes. and grew up as any young man in the church, singing in the choir, mm -hmm. you know, enjoying church and, and worship and what have you. Uh, was the whole family united in this transition? No, no, no. they weren't. Unfortunately, no. my uh, father wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, my father... Uh, was a man who works hard, mm -hmm. uh, gets up early and out the house, and he works all day and comes in, provided well for his mm -hmm. family. Mm -hmm. um, but he wasn't really a man of of, of overt, obvious faith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he, he he was a quiet man, and he never stood in our way, never prevented us from mm -hmm. worshiping. Mm -hmm. Would take us to church and drop us off, really? but wouldn't come in. Yes, mm -hmm. wouldn't come in. Mm -hmm. um, but he was uh, not one who would come to church or would participate in church at all or worship or reading the Bible. Uh, even on Sunday, he wouldn't go? On Sundays, he did. On Sundays, he would yeah. go to church. Yes, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. For Clara, help me to clarify that. Mm -hmm. On Sundays, we, we would go together. Oh, you would go that. together. I remember mm -hmm. that. I remember him going, and we would all dress up in our suit mm -hmm. and ties, and, and we would go. But after we made the transition, yes. uh, he stopped attending. Oh, oh, yeah. He stopped he would, attending. He wasn't go attending either. anywhere. Mm. Yes. And um, not until years, years later, mm -hmm. uh, at the age of probably 60, mm -hmm. 60, 65, I was preaching because I had become a minister. Mm -hmm. I was speaking one Sabbath and preaching, mm -hmm. and I gave an appeal for men and women to give their hearts to Christ. And my dad stood up. Oh. <laughs> And tears were streaming down his face, and tears were streaming down my face. And he stood up and he walked down the aisle. And we embraced each other, and he gave his heart to Christ. And from that day on, he was there with us uh, until, you know, he passed away. Yeah, it's a great thing to, to be a parent and to invite and to accept your children in yes. the, in the yes. fold, but to, to be a, a son yes. and to do that for your dad, yes. Yes. that's that very, very special. Very special, very special moment, very powerful moment. And from then on, he never missed church. He was always at worship <laughs> and uh, would always see him with his Bible. Uh, he had to move at his own pace. And I think mm -hmm. that's, that's the way God is with us. He allows us to move at our own pace yeah. and time. I'm just glad that he was able to make that decision, you know, before he passed away. Uh, that happened, uh, I mean, at an earlier age of unusual? He passed away, you know, he was um, 89. Oh, yes. he, he had so a he long... Yes, he was 89 uh, years yeah, old. Oh, quite long. Um, and so he had time to enjoy yes, yes. being in the faith. Did he enjoy? Yes, Did, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. He became a deacon and oh. he, he enjoyed it. And uh -huh. he was always at church. I remember a very humorous moment once I was home visiting and yeah. my mother was taking a little longer to get ready for church. <laughs> and my dad said, okay, now 
I'm going to have to leave you because I've got to get there. I need to be a child. <laughs> <laughs> so now he was leaving and anxious to get there with, before everybody else. So, um, but he, he thoroughly enjoyed. And wonderful. the family was back together, yeah, worshiping wonderful, together. Wonderful. And that was beautiful because the father That's sets good. the pace and is the model sure. for, for the rest of the sure. family. But in the absence of my father attending worship with us, my mother yeah, to, yeah, took yeah. that role on mm -hmm. and led the way. And she continued to pray mm. for my dad and pray for her husband daily and setting a good example. Mm. So. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned earlier that you grew up in difficult times, mm -hmm. racially speaking. Uh, did you feel, do you have uh, clear memories of, uh, you know, being like second class? Yes, I, uh, there were instances that I do remember. I think one that stays in my mind, uh, my mother and I were downtown in downtown Atlanta, and she had been shopping, and she was taking me with her, and mm -hmm. I was young. Uh, and I remember we went into a department store where they were buying and selling, and it had a, a, a deli or a little restaurant, and you could stop and buy food. Mm -hmm. And I remember we went in and my mother uh, had me by the hand and, and we went to sit down at the counter. Mm -hmm. And the lady said to her, you know you can't sit here. You know that colored folk are supposed to stand or go on the opposite side. <laughs> and so she looked at the lady and she grabbed my hand and I think we moved down to way down on the opposite end and she ordered and we waited what seemed like forever to get our food. <laughs> and um, they bag, bagged it up for us and we left out. Mm -hmm. But I always remember that, that because of the color of my skin, uh, my physical features, because I was not like someone else, that I didn't have the same privilege. And, uh, and my mother was treated unfairly. So that stayed with me. But I think I could have, as I grew up and became older, I could have become a militant and angry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I listen a lot to the words of Martin Luther King as he talked about love, as he talked about mercy and compassion, and as he talked about being close to God and true to God and being nonviolent. Yeah. And so I learned that lesson and I grew up in that environment, but with more compassion and love in my heart than anger. Hmm. So that was my part of my experience as a young kid growing up. In schools, you have been in segregated or in integrated schools? Yes, we were segregated. Segregated. Uh, in school, uh, not until I reached uh, high school. Uh -huh. My secondary years of ninth through twelfth did I attend uh, an integrated school, and uh, there were a few challenges. But by that time. Uh, in the 70s, uh, things were much better, much better. and uh, there wasn't much uh, chaos or obvious mm -hmm. discrimination mm -hmm. and problems that, that uh, I encountered uh, during that time. As a young man, I played sports, and during the summer, we worked for the county office. Mm. And in the county office, we could do really hard labor to build up our muscles so we could go out and play football. <laughs> uh, but in this office, I'll never forget, I was in the 11th grade, we went into the building, and in the building, I noticed on the walls, the signs had not been taken down. There were colored bathrooms and white bathrooms. There were colored water fountains and white water fountains. And it was surreal because this was the 70s and those signs were still there, but we were all working together and, and what have you. But it just reminded me of a painful past uh, that was still present in some ways uh, in the South in the 70s. Um, but it really brought it home that this was real and this happened. And for some people, it was continuing. It's continuing. You know, but for most of us, it, it wasn't. It, mm -hmm. it was a much better time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, how, so so you, you spoke very moving about the conversion of the family. Um, from that point on, was your spiritual uh, journey smooth and straight or uh, with some ups and downs and uh, stuff? I, yes, I, um, well, I think just like any adolescent, any yes. teen, uh, as you're growing and you're challenging boundaries mm -hmm. and you're challenging your parents and what they say is right and wrong, um, 
But we had a really wonderful environment to grow in, in the church environment. There were many activities for the children and the teenagers. Uh, they kept us busy and doing quite a bit. And there were moments, I think, when as teenagers would, uh, we would slip out and try to do things we shouldn't do or uh, drink things we shouldn't be drinking, like a beer or something, and didn't know how to do it or <laughs> didn't really buy it and, you know, doing silly things and making silly mistakes. But I think in the back of my head, I've always had and in my heart, the consciousness that it's not so much what my mother and father think or what they see or don't see, it's God, mm -hmm. and He's always with me. And there's never anywhere I can go where God does not know. Yeah. So my relationship with God grew to, I know you're watching, but I'm going to do this anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and the mercy of God and the grace of God to put up with me and to still watch over me and protect me uh, is still amazing to me you know, today, uh, how much God loves us. You know, and He's patient with us. And so I had those moments and trials and and times when I felt really close to God as a teenager, as a 16-year-old or 15-year-old. And there were times when I felt like I was a wild kid doing really wild things. Uh, but later in life, for many of my friends, they reminded me, we always knew you were going to be a pastor. You were always a good really? kid, right? So, <laughs> you, yeah. you had some somewhat different yes, memories. Yes, I have but... different memories that I was a really bad kid. But <laughs> they said, no, we always knew you were going to be a pastor. And I said, what? I was trying so hard to be bad. You know? And they said, no, you were a good guy. Yeah, so. But your standards were so much higher. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, 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 yeah, so it was a, but it was an enjoyable teen years and, and growing up experiences. You know? So, so uh, when and how did you uh, figure out what were you going to do and to be in life? Yes. Well, I was never really a great student uh, because I just really didn't take uh, secondary school, high school uh, as uh, that important. <laughs> never really thought about going to college and furthering my education. Really? I would graduate and find a job and work. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a young lady in my life in high school, mm. my high school sweetheart. <laughs> so I decided to make a really great home and a really great future for us. I decided to join the United States Air Force and become an Air Force military member so that I could make a great home and a great future and great, great military benefits mm. uh, for the love of my life and oh. make a family. After being in the military for six months, I received a letter from her and she said, oh, my feelings have changed. And so she decided that we would no longer be a couple. So of course my heart was broken wow. and they call those Dear John letters. So she sent me a <laughs> Dear John letter and, and I read it and, and uh, I was teary and, you know, very disappointed about it. Um, Did you change your mind? Uh, I didn't. I, I, I uh, stayed in the military, I, yeah. but I went back to visit uh, home and I went to visit her. Oh. And I found out it was more than what she had said. Oh. We were walking in downtown Atlanta and talking. And she said to me that my mother said to me that I should not marry someone who is a Seventh-day Adventist. I should not marry someone. Her mother. Her mother, oh. who is a Sabbath keeper. Because oh. your faith is a cult. It's not a true Christian faith and that I should not associate with you. And Excuse so, me, when, uh, when her mother said a Sabbath keeper, she was meaning s Saturday or Sunday? Saturday. Saturday, Saturday, Saturday yes, but Saturday. not, not, the, not the belonging to the church organization. Yes, Interesting. yes. So, and, um, Excuse me, her mother was a Sabbath, a Sabbath keeper? No, she mother, was not. her mother was not. Her very, was not very interesting, Sabbath very keeper. intriguing, yeah. I later found out that her mother had some bad experiences, uh -huh. negative experiences, with Seventh-day Adventists and with Sabbath keepers. Oh. They were, the ones she encountered were very hardline, mm -hmm. very conservative, mm -hmm. and really did not express the love of Christ, mm -hmm. but more the legalistic law of I Christ. See, and see. so she had a really negative perspective of who we were. Mm -hmm. And that was unfortunate, yeah. but she shared it with her daughter. Mm -hmm. And her daughter said to me, she said, if you change your faith and mm -hmm. you don't stay in that church, then we can be together. Hmm. Now, this is the love of my life. <laughs> and I said to her, no, can't do that. My heart 
has been given to God. And I believe in the Sabbath being the seventh day. Mm -hmm. And so we separated, we parted, mm -hmm. yes. But that was a test for me, you know, mm -hmm. as to who is the Lord of my life and what's the most important mm -hmm. thing in my life. And it was Christ, it wasn't her at that moment. Now many young people feel that's impossible. It's impossible to go against your heart. Mm. <laughs> yes. How, how, how yeah. do you remember yeah. of, of, of your feelings how did your heart beat when, when you got that letter? And especially uh, after a while, and as I understand, you began, you know, uh, gathering again uh, hope and, uh, uh, you know, interest. Maybe, maybe if I meet her face to face, maybe mm -hmm. I'll be able to revive her trust and her love for me and then to find again that yes. this is not possible. Do yes. you remember the, t the inner mm -hmm. turmoil, the going against your heart, how it was for you. Yes. It is possible, it's damaging, it's yes. killing you. <laughs> even while you're, 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 you're uh, speaking about it, right, mm -hmm. and describing it, my heart is churning, my, my stomach is churning as I remember, right? It's just very powerful emotions, especially yeah. when you're young and you're in love, right? And you feel that this is the only person the only, yeah. that I will ever meet that I will love this much. And it, it, it's wonderful right? to yes. think that. I don't yes. think we should uh, be no. casual. And, no. but no. So, you, you so it was you a know? wonderful feeling of knowing her and being with her, a very, mm. very nice young lady. Yeah. Um, and I remember when she shared that with me, uh, and I said to myself, I have to make a decision. Yeah. Uh, and it was a difficult decision. Uh, and I was saddened, of course, by the decision. But I remember I didn't hesitate. And mm -hmm. I said to her, my faith is important to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to continue to keep the Sabbath because I believe it is the Bible Sabbath. Mm -hmm. And um, so I guess that means that we can't be together. Mm -hmm. uh, I was heartbroken, heartbroken. Yeah. And never thought I would ever find yeah. another yeah. love. <laughs> right? That was it. Life was over. Had you? Uh, and, and, and so, well, I, you know, we parted, we parted company yeah. and remain friends to yeah, some degree, yeah, yeah. but life went on. Mm -hmm. But when you're there and you're in love and yeah, you're in the throes of it the, and you're the, young, you feel life the is world. over, that's it, that's it. <laughs> and so even in those moments, God is with us and he brought me through it, you know, and life went on, mm -hmm. you know, life went on for her and life went on for me. Um, but that was one experience I'll never forget as a young man yeah, yeah. in love with my high school sweetheart. So sometimes the mind and the conscience can, can decide, can rule over the heart. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yes, yes. Yeah, we have to, sometimes we have to. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. when I hearken back to those days and I think about my childhood, I think my mother uh, provided for me such a fertile place in our home to develop a relationship, a loving relationship with Christ. Mm -hmm. And through mm -hmm. my parents' experience, and especially my mother's experience, I learned to really love Christ and to really believe that Christ loves me. Mm -hmm. And I saw him in her. I saw Christ in my experience with her. I knew that there was nothing I could do that would ever stop her from loving me. Oh, Nothing. That's so precious. Now, she would not justify it sure. if I was wrong, sure. right? And she would scold me, mm -hmm. but it would never stop her from loving me. Yeah. And I translated that thought and feeling from her to that's what it must be like with Christ. Mm -hmm. There's nothing I could do that would ever cause him to stop loving yeah. me. Now, he can't justify and will not justify or clear me of my wrong. But even in that, when he has to discipline me, he still loves me. And to me, that's the relationship that I've always had with Christ, is that no matter what, he loves me. And he will ever be with me. And he invites me, invites me to love him. And then gives me reason to do that, but it's my choice. And so that's my, that's my relationship with Christ <laughs> that I, I grew up with. You mentioned, uh, I think, th several times of that uh, your mature uh, conversion and mm -hmm. uh, turning uh, mm -hmm. your face to, to Christ mm -hmm. came a little later in life. Mm -hmm. uh, can you add a, a few more details? I was 22 mm -hmm. in the United States Air Force. I was a medical corpsman 
and I was a paramedic where I drove the ambulance, worked in the back of the ambulance, and I was an EMT, EMS paramedic. And I was 22 years old, had a lot of friends, still in church, but I was wavering back and forth. And I'm not the kind of person that likes to waver back and forth. Mm -hmm. I like to either be left yeah. or right, mm -hmm. right? And so there was one day when I had a near-death experience with some mm -hmm. friends, and mm -hmm. we were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And mm -hmm. um, it sort of shocked me into reality that God's protection is with me, but life is very short. Mm -hmm. And so I thought at that moment, I said, you know, I need to make decisions in life. And as I was thinking on this, it was one night late in the hospital. I was working the night shift. Mm -hmm. And I was walking down the hallway thinking about this. A tall uh, Air Force officer was coming towards me. And as it became clearer, it was the chaplain. And he was a priest, Catholic priest. Mm -hmm. And as he came towards me and I saw the cross on his collar, mm -hmm. I stopped and asked him, I said, chap, I need to talk with you. And I shared with him my struggle about living for Christ, being true to Christ, but also wanting to live a different life. I don't remember our entire conversation, but I will always remember these words. He said to me, be true to your faith, be true to your calling, and be true to God. Hmm. I will always remember that. And he said it with such conviction, but at the same time, compassion. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, I began to struggle with whether or not I was going to be true to God or not mm -hmm. and follow him and live my life with Christian standards and values and principles or just move away from that altogether. Mm -hmm. So I so actually, it was, a parting point it was a parting point. It was a parting point for me to make a decision. Mm -hmm. So I took the Bible mm -hmm. and my favorite book, Desire of Ages, mm -hmm. I took two weeks off from work, two really? weeks. They gave me two weeks leave. Mm. I sat in the library for two weeks, reading the Bible and Desire of Ages and praying. I would go home, pray, read, come back to the library the next day, the same thing. I had no contact with my friends or anyone. Mm. This was just my time with God. Mm. I said, I must make a decision. Mm. In the midst of those two weeks, I started to read about Jesus in Gethsemane. And I started to, for the first time in my life, believe that Christ Jesus suffered in the Garden of Gethsemane on the cross just for me. I started to see for the first time that it was my sin that placed him there. And that was not fair. For the first time in my life, my heart was broken, split in two. And I sat there in the library at 22 years old, weeping and crying like a baby. <laughs> and I'll never forget, the librarian came over to me and put her arms around me. She said, son, are you okay? <laughs> I said, I'll be okay. Because <laughs> I'm crying. And at that moment, I gave my heart to Christ. <laughs> and I said, I'm yours. I surrender. I believe. And from that moment on, I began to have a sensation and impression on my heart and mind that I wanted to share the same gospel and I wanted to impact the lives of mm. young men and women the way this chaplain had impacted mm. my life. And I enjoyed the military and I felt I was being called to serve God as a minister. I said, Lord, I'd like to be a chaplain. Mm -hmm. And that was the first moment when I thought that of was the first, the first yes, moment. That was mm -hmm. a, so I felt I was being called by God to serve men and women in the military mm. as a chaplain, as a clergy person, and to be with them wherever they go and to present Christ to them. Um, and that's, so that was a choice I began to make. Shortly after, I began to think of separating from the military, mm -hmm. getting my discharge, and going back to school and becoming a minister, which started another journey. Yes, so that was a turning point. Yes. Not so much uh, outside, I mean exterior, but very much inside. Very much. I think mm. it was a turning point, but I think it was also a new starting point. A new starting point. Right? And I think we have those stages and moments mm -hmm. where we have to restart, mm -hmm. jump start. Mm -hmm. And I think for me that was a starting point of a sincere, committed relationship with Christ. 
not a perfect relationship, but a sincere, committed relationship to follow Christ and to do whatever he needed me to do and to learn how to do that. <laughs> and so I had to make that decision at that stage of my life. Uh, when did you share that with your mother? Well, I, I shared that with my mother and my father, both of them, mm -hmm. um, what my decision had been. My father was very quiet. He didn't mm -hmm. say too much. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother, I think she sort of wept, teary a little bit. And, you know, mm -hmm. and she said, follow your heart and what God is leading mm -hmm. you to do. And that was yeah. pretty much it. And, um, but they were very proud that I was able to make decisions for myself and that I had been a pretty decent guy. Uh, briefly, where did you study? What did you study uh, in order to, to fulfill your vision? Well, I learned that I needed to go back to school yes. and I needed to get a uh, college degree. Yes. And remember, I told you earlier, I never really wanted to go to college, right? <laughs> Now I have to go to become a clergy person and a chaplain. So I learned I needed a four-year bachelor degree in theology or religion. Yeah. Uh, I learned that I was going to need a Master of Divinity degree, which was graduate school. I learned that I would have to be ordained and I had to be endorsed by our church to serve. And I thought for a minute, I said, wow, this is a long path. You know, I thought it was going to be quicker than that. But uh, so I knew that I needed to separate from the military, get my discharge. And I entered Oakwood uh, College mm -hmm, in Huntsville, mm -hmm. Alabama, mm -hmm. studied theology mm -hmm. and psychology, mm -hmm. uh, was a student missionary in Africa while I was a student at Oakwood, uh, did quite a bit of traveling around preaching and evangelism and teaching. Uh, I left Oakwood College and went to uh, uh, Andrews Andrew, University yes. uh, in Bering Springs, Michigan, the seminary, to pursue my Master of Divinity degree. While there, I pastored, uh, associate pastor at the Shiloh Seventh-day mm -hmm. Adventist Church in Chicago, mm -hmm. uh, on the south side of Chicago. That was a wonderful experience. Tough place, <laughs> but it was a great experience, right? And um, I was hired by the South Atlantic Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, oh. to be a pastor. And when I returned to Atlanta, uh, I was given two churches and I pastored. And eventually uh, I was ordained as a Seventh-day Adventist minister. Once I was ordained, I applied to go back into the military as a chaplain yes. uh, in the Navy. And I spent uh, my time as a Navy chaplain, also as a Marine Corps chaplain, mm -hmm. uh, and enjoyed that immensely. Until time for me to separate and I asked the Lord and I wanted to go back into the hospital environment and uh, separated from the military and became a hospital chaplain uh, where I stayed for some 14 years. <laughs> uh, in, uh, in Romania, in general, this institution called chaplaincy mm -hmm. okay. pro probably is not uh, very developed mm -hmm. and as clear as it, it, it's uh, here. Uh, traditionally, uh, priests uh, were uh, involved in the in the life of the army, in mm -hmm. hospitals, but uh, uh, here it has a different uh, connotation. And mm -hmm. would you uh, briefly explain what's the work of a, a chaplain here? What's the stat status, uh, uh, the different branches, like you mentioned military, uh, hospital, mm -hmm. and uh, there are others. Would you create a little bit of a, of a background so that what we are going to speak after that will be easier easy understood. Okay. Chaplains are men and women who have received a call from God to serve as clergy persons, as ministers of the gospel. And they've chosen that pathway uh, to accept it for themselves. And it is also very similar to being the pastor, uh, the priest in a local parish or church, but your parish or your congregation becomes an institutional environment, uh, whether it's military or university or academy, uh, hospice environment, hospitals, uh, also in industry and uh, work environments mm -hmm. and Fortune 500 companies, uh, many have chaplains really? now, mm. men and women who are there to 
be enmeshed in and a part of the institution and organization mm. uh, of a business environment, of a work environment, of a military environment, to wear the uniform, to speak the language, to be a part of that group and that environment, uh, but to be the spiritual representative, mm -hmm. right? The person there who is responsible for the spiritual well-being of the men and women who are in that organization or institution. And you're there to represent or as a representative also of your particular faith or denomination. <laughs> and you become, you must be endorsed by your denomination, by your church to serve and represent them as a chaplain. But there's a unique difference between chaplains and pastors or priests. The chaplain is there to serve everyone. everyone. It doesn't matter the faith, the denomination. So not every religion. denomination has a chaplain. That right. There, there are some that are not represented, but many are, but some are not represented. And if you are the one who's hired for that organization as a chaplain, uh, they may only have a budget to hire sure. one chaplain. Sure. But you have many people faith, and many, many faith groups. And so you are the person who will help those individuals to connect with their understanding of God, their practice of God, their rituals and their rites. And if there's something that a person needs in their particular faith tradition, but it is not a part of your tradition as a chaplain, your responsibility is to find a clergy person, a priest or another individual who can provide that service so, yes, yes. so that they can exercise their religious faith. Sure. Um, and so the chaplain uh, role is a very unique role, and uh, not everyone can do it. It is, mm -hmm. it is a calling. It is a specialized field. Uh, we have a saying in chaplaincy that all chaplains are pastors, but not and all pastors, pastors are, are chap called to be chaplains. Mm -hmm. It is a specialized calling. And... Um, to be in that field. So some of the areas uh, where you serve uh, are the military, which means uh, you bear uniform. I wear the uniform mm -hmm. of the military branch mm -hmm. that I mm -hmm. am serving with. Yeah. Yes. So uh, when uh, uh, troops are deployed to different mm -hmm. places, uh, the chaplains go with them at the yes. end, live the same, the same life yes. with them. Yes. And uh, in conflict, in conflict, chaplains don't go into conflict. Sure. They don't go into battle. Sure. Um, chaplains do not carry weapons. Sure. They are there to be the spiritual leader and provide the spiritual services and religious services for the men and women in military. But chaplains are considered to be non-combatants. Sure. So they are held to a different standard than those who bear arms. And so that's why we don't bear arms. We're not combatants. We're there to provide a comforting religious service, worship experience, and emotional and spiritual comfort for the troops. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that uh, when uh, you know there is a confrontation, the chaplain stays ten miles behind the line and protected and well. And uh, in sometimes the, in they, the they military, are military, in the I think things change. There were men and women I met who were chaplains in, let's say, Vietnam mm -hmm. era war, and they had a different model of chaplaincy mm -hmm. where it appears that they were much closer to the conflict yeah, and yeah. the combat. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in modern day chaplaincy, you will find uh, chaplains who are close to where the combat is. For instance, I know men and women who serve in Afghanistan uh -huh. as chaplains or mm -hmm. in Iraq as chaplains. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But they try not to move chaplains into active, uh, active combat, combat mm -hmm. uh, an active, uh, active scene of violence and war, but to leave the chaplain back a few paces and a few steps, <laughs> not too close. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but chaplains are very close, and they're yeah, there, yeah. and they're seeing as men and women are coming back, and yeah, that they're and injured take, and yeah, hurt and yeah, what yeah, have yeah. you. Or dying. Or dying. Yeah. They're there. So, uh, and chaplains do have to travel when they're in country and deployed. They do have to move around and mm -hmm. sometimes they can get caught up in the conflict sure. uh, and can't get caught and up some, in the violence. Sometimes they can be hurt or die. They yeah. can be hurt or they can lose life. Yeah, and yeah. you know that when you put on the uniform, mm -hmm. you become a part of that unit and that deployment 
and you know that they are a risk. Yeah, let me ask you a more difficult question. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, chaplains go there because uh, uh, as, uh, as spiritual uh, caretakers, they are to be where people are. Mm -hmm. You don't serve, uh, you know, and I mean, immaterial entities. You you know, mm -hmm. you you serve people, yes, real real yes, people, real where people. they are, yes. where they are. Yes. Uh, however, uh, attending uh, the be, being with the military, uh, uh, being maybe c very close with a combat uh, zone, uh, is perceived as an endorsement or. Uh, um, yeah, endorsement, approval uh, by the church or by God mm -hmm. of everything which is being uh, done uh, uh, there. Mm -hmm. um, that is a difficult yeah. question and uh, conversation for some, but it often comes up. Yeah. If my being a part of this military combat unit and they are going out to wage war, yeah. um, for the right reasons, for to preserve democracy or freedom, and we feel that it's a just cause, by the chaplain being there, by the clergy person being there as a chaplain, are you endorsing violence? Yes. Are you endorsing killing. war and killing. killing? And that conversation is often debated and discussed. Mm -hmm. um, you are there not to endorse war, not to endorse killing or murder or violence, but you are there because the men and women who are serving, they have a constitutional right. They have a right to freely exercise their religious faith. Yes. And for many that means coming together with the clergy representative and experiencing communion service, mm -hmm. the sacramental services, whatever mm -hmm. service and ritual they have mm -hmm. that are often administered by an ordained and an endorsed clergy person. Yes. And that representative needs to be there as well with sure. the men and women who are served. And so you're there for a very specific, specific purpose. However, your presence may suggest to some that you're that you are there to endorse what is happening. Giving giving God's blessing on giving God's blessing on what's happening. So it's a difficult, it's a difficult I, 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 a question. It's a mm -hmm. difficult place to be, mm -hmm. and I think chaplains often try to make sure that they're not viewed as that person mm -hmm. who's giving. We're going to have war. We're going to have conflict. Unfortunately, yeah. I'm often I often say that I'm glad that chaplains are there because hopefully we will help to keep people ethically and morally focused. Mm -hmm. So there won't be rampant bloodshed and you know, unwarranted death and violence. But as we are there in the midst of that, we can remind people of compassion and care and good morality and ethics yeah. uh, and so that we won't go too far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So thank, th th thank you. Difficult yeah, thank you. Uh, briefly, let's cover a few of the other uh, areas where mm -hmm. chaplains serve. We will deserve uh, hospital chaplaincy yes. for the next conversation. Mm -hmm. So let's speak on prisons. Is God uh, present yeah. in the prisons? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really do. Uh, you know, men you, and women. You didn't serve in prison. Yes, I mean, I, as a chaplain. I, I haven't served as a chaplain, uh, as a prison mm -hmm. or a chaplain. Um, but I have many friends who serve as uh, prison chaplains, and they love their work. Mm -hmm. They are there to be that same representative of God, to show compassion. The men and women there who have either been justly or unjustly sometimes, incarcerated. Sometimes, yeah still need to have the opportunity to serve and worship their God. Mm -hmm. And so the chaplain is there for that. The chaplains are often also trained to help people through emotional struggles and distress. Uh, chaplains also are there to minister to the prisoners' families who will come and visit mm -hmm. and to try to bridge that gap mm -hmm. and to help that family with the stress and the, of separation and, and the children who are growing up without father or mother. And so chaplains are there 
for various reasons. Also, they're there for the prison for staff. staff yeah, they're there for the, war, the wardens of the prison yeah. and the guards uh, because it's stressful. Oh. And so they're there to bring a sense of comfort and a, a sense of compassion mm -hmm. and maybe help to relieve stress and uh, to keep a sense of care and, again, ethics and morality. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, also, we need to be humane and caring mm -hmm. towards people who are in court incarcerated. And so I think having the chaplain there is a plus yeah. for everyone. And once in a while, uh, the, a part of a redemption story with prisoners yes. Who, yes. who change their thinking, yes. mm -hmm. come to, to repent yes. and to, to begin a new life. Yes, a um, new starting point new for starting them, point. right? For them as well, and turning point in their life, and they're able to, to start mm -hmm. over again. And often the contact with the chaplain and chaplains hold worship services and chapel services, administer mm -hmm. communions and mm -hmm. other services while, you know, men and women are incarcerated. And so the presence of God goes behind bars. Even mm -hmm. Jesus said in Matthew 25, you know, when I was in prison, you came, or you you came didn't. and you visited me, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need to follow Jesus' uh, command and his request. And as we minister to those who are incarcerated, Jesus said, it is as if you're doing it for me. me. So we're not to forget them yeah. and not to act as if they are throwaway people. Mm -hmm. You know, no, God loves every man and woman and they can change, they can turn. Probably in some of the prisons here in the, in the United States, in those states which still have capital punishment, mm -hmm. part of their role is also to assist uh, the inmates uh, who are on the death row yes, and yes. in the last moments yeah, of their lives. Yeah. Hearing their that's, confession if they're Catholics and being with them for very, prayer if they're Protestant. Very and, unique. You know, but being with people all the way through to the end of their life. You know, something about pastors and priests and clergy, we are with often people from the start of their life to the end of their life. Yes, yes. You know, we go through stages yeah, of life yeah, yeah, with yeah. individuals. Yeah, yeah. And so for me, that's God's representatives, those men and women, because God is with me through all the stages of my life, good and the bad. Yes. He doesn't leave us. And so I'm glad that chaplains can be there in prison. And, and then academic, um, in our universities, yeah. you have campus chaplains who are there for the students. And they are also hired by the, by the university? Yes, hired by the university. That's interesting. And uh, supported by the university. That's interesting. And they hold worship services. They're there for counseling and support and comfort. And, you know, that's a really good place for chaplains because oftentimes in college, you know, men and young men and women, they're still trying to figure out life. Yeah. Uh, they still have to make decisions. Yeah. And having that presence of the chaplain can be a, a, a very comforting uh, presence and also help to sort of guide and direct their path. And also in... Uh in legislative legislative bodies, congresses, yes, uh, city uh, uh, city councils, yes. or yeah. One of my mentors, uh, he is the uh, Senate chaplain uh, in the United States Senate, uh, highest level of government in America, mm -hmm. and he is the chaplain. Yeah. And he will give a prayer before every session. Mm -hmm. And so I'm glad that he's there to do that as men and women are grappling with very, very serious very decisions that affect vast people's consequences. lives. Vast consequences. Yeah. And so I'm glad that in the midst of that, before they start to grapple with these yes, tough decisions, yes. that the presence of God is there through his prayer. Yes. And he's able to ask God's blessing and direction for these important decisions as they go forward. So yes, chaplains are embedded all in, in many different industries and organizations and businesses uh, so that men and women can have someone there to help to be a comfort and deal mm -hmm. with emotional issues and bring stress down and just be a moral presence. Yeah, and uh, so on one hand, it's a place full of, of, of oppor opportunities to serve. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's something uh, probably, pro probably all of us should, uh, should learn because when, when as a pastor you serve in a church, mm -hmm. uh, in a way you do the rules. I mean, of course, so there are the rules of the church, but yeah. you are 
part of them. Uh, when, yes. you, when you go in another organization, mm -hmm. that organization was they are set for a different uh, mm -hmm. uh, goal, mm -hmm. and they have their uh, hierarchy, mm -hmm. they have their structure, they have their rules, mm -hmm. they have uh, their ways of right. doing yes. and not, not, not doing things, and you are invited uh, there to fulfill your mission, but within uh, their set of rules. Yes. Yes. You so. you had you have to fit uh, the yes. if you go and try to disrupt everything. <laughs> right. Yes, yes, yes. You are going to be ejected. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think for chaplains, uh, the chaplain is often the the moral, ethical representative within an organization. Mm -hmm. And so I think there are pinch points. There mm -hmm. are moments when the chaplain sees him or herself as a prophet. Mm -hmm. and ask whether or not I should speak to a oh, certain moral oh, or ethical oh. issue within the organization yeah. that may go against, against the prevailing the, thought yeah, yeah. or the, the rule mm -hmm. or the regulation. And that can be a difficult place because the organization could say, thank you for sharing, now <laughs> <But> here's the <laughs> door. <laughs> we no longer want to employ you. And so the chaplain has to be careful but also not be afraid mm. to speak to right and wrong and to be an ethical person. To be it. true to, to be his, <laughs> to yes, his calling, to his be, be true heart. To your calling, <laughs> be true to your God, that's right. So uh, yes, chaplains have to learn that balance. Chaplain, thank you very much and I can't wait to have the next conversation on the more specific area of your work. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.